After I betrayed my boyfriend by cheating and then left him, he took his own life. Following the advice of my therapist, I've made the decision to document and share the events that have unfolded in my life over the past year. My goal is to present everything in a coherent manner, which required numerous edits and several rewrites. I once considered myself a skilled writer, but I had lost touch with that talent years ago. A friend suggested this forum as a place for confession, penance, and as a cautionary tale for others. I committed an atrocious act that led to consequences far worse than I could have ever imagined. I am sharing this with the full understanding that many will despise me for my actions and the chain of events triggered by my betrayal. Reading my own words is nauseating because I am acutely aware that what I did is unforgivable. I comprehend all too well how tragically needless the events that followed were. My only hope is that my story resonates with anyone in a relationship, potentially preventing future betrayals. Specifically, I wish that someone who is currently cheating or contemplating it might read this and reconsider their actions. Many might view my situation as an extreme and rare example of the fallout from being unfaithful, but I've been informed by individuals far more knowledgeable than I that my circumstances are, unfortunately, not unique. I am prepared to endure the hatred that comes with sharing this if it means even one person might avoid breaking the heart of someone they love. I am a 28-year-old woman, and eight months ago, I was married to an incredible man whom I will refer to as William. Eight months prior, my husband confronted me with undeniable evidence that I had been both emotionally and physically unfaithful. Just a few days after he confronted me about my infidelity, he tragically took his own life. Realizing this as I write it breaks me, because people I don't even know now harbor hatred towards me. I couldn't fathom that I had the capacity to commit such a heinous act against someone I had loved since childhood, yet I did. If either William or I had ever been asked if we would ever be unfaithful, we would have both laughed it off. However, to my shock and disbelief, I allowed myself to stray and lose focus on our relationship. I knew that betraying him would devastate him if he ever found out, but I shattered the heart of the man I loved so brutally that he couldn't bear the pain of life any longer. To those of you who might be thinking that I don't deserve to live, I understand and agree wholeheartedly. I have attempted suicide twice, and while I'm convinced there is a reason I'm still here for now, I believe that the longer I live, the more I suffer. I don't deserve the mercy of being gone. To be honest, William and I had grown up together. I can recall my early childhood vividly, and at no point did I ever doubt William's presence in my life. We attended the same Sunday school classes, the same public schools, and our families had been friends long before either of us existed. William always had a way of making me laugh. While children can often be unkind, William was never one of them. In sixth grade, I realized I found him attractive, though it wasn't an official crush until high school. From early high school through college, William and I were each other's first and only loves. We were best friends who cherished one another deeply. After graduation, we took a year to secure stable jobs close to our families and decided to get married. We took vacations together and were incredibly passionate, making love whenever the opportunity arose. Our only physical intimacy outside of that was during that time of the month, but even then, we would share hours of beautiful, passionate moments. I threw it all away for something so trivial and worthless. We had plans to have children, even knowing their names in advance. We were both virgins before marriage, he was my first everything, and I was his first everything. A part of me wishes I could say I had a drunken one-night stand and tried to keep that from my husband, but no. I became emotionally and physically involved with a man who was inferior to my husband in every possible way. I never considered that a friendship with another man could lead to a deep attachment forming. My husband and I had a strong marriage, foolish as that sounds now. My husband was the epitome of strength, I was the one who was weak. Before this, I considered myself a strong woman, but no one had ever told me that while our relationship was exceptionally strong, no relationship is invulnerable. Not a day goes by that I don't wish someone had walked up and taken my life, especially the moment before anything I did became secretive. It's an indisputable fact that the world would be a far better place with my husband alive and me not existing. The truth is undeniable. I had numerous chances to stop everything before anything happened, and I had absolutely no reason to allow it to happen. After a brief and heated conversation, he walked out, and I never spoke to him again. I tried to reach out in every possible way, 
hoping to let him know how truly sorry I was, to express my hatred for what I did. My messages to him never went beyond the unread status, so I doubt he saw any of my emails or heard my voicemails. Everyone advised me to give him space and time to think. Two nights after William confronted me at 3.17 a.m., there was a loud knock at the front door. I turned on the lights, thinking it might be someone drunk and upset or worse. Then, another loud knock followed, and I quickly put on a hoodie before heading to the door. When I opened it and saw two policemen, I immediately knew why they were there. They informed me that William's body had been found, confirming his suicide. I was devastated. I fell to my knees and let out a scream of agony, tearing at my skin and hair as the police tried to calm me down. By the time the EMTs arrived, I was sitting on the steps, rocking back and forth, repeatedly saying, I'm so, so sorry. There was no way I could attend the funeral, even if William's family had allowed my family to be there. I was kept sedated for days. The first thing I wanted to do upon release was visit William's grave, but no one knew where his parents had buried him, which cut deeply, because I had tried to cut deeply that very night, when I attempted to take my own life for the first time. I've now been hospitalized twice for attempted suicide, not seeking pity, because nothing can alleviate this heartache or numb the pain. A part of me wishes I had somehow forced him to see me, just for a brief moment, to tell him how sorry I was and that our marriage was over. But I didn't deserve that, and I have to face the fact that what I did was so vile that making William see me might have driven him to take his life even sooner. Many people have told me that my actions led him to take his own life. I don't doubt it. Until that horrible day, William had been unbelievably happy, we both had been. He left no suicide note to confirm that I was the cause of his death, but we had been so happy, spending nearly every moment together. To go from that kind of bliss to such profound grief, in such a short time ultimately ended his life. I ended it. My words, actions, and thoughts betrayed us both. Regret doesn't kill you, but if it did, I would have died before William even confronted me. When Covid hit, William and I quarantined together. I was fortunate enough to teach at an exclusive private school where the benefactors assured us our salaries were secure as long as the need for isolation persisted. William worked from home and made significant progress on a project he was leading. The entire world was worried and fearful, but we had each other and made the most of our time, watching movies in bed, feeding each other, playing like two little children. I am deeply sorry to those who lost loved ones to that horrible disease. What the world experienced was a literal plague on humanity, causing so much needless death. However, my husband and I grew closer during those weeks than we ever had before, and our bond was incredibly strong. We joked about how many people dreaded spending time with family or, heaven forbid, their spouse, while we simply couldn't get enough of each other. After the first month, we had to agree to limit intimacy to once a day for about a week. Our only argument, during the entire quarantine, was about doing laundry, just to put clean sheets on the bed again. Yet, I still cheated on the man I was so closely bonded with. I was an idiot in so many ways, believing that because of our bond, no temptation could make me stray. I hate myself in numerous ways for countless reasons, but knowing I had it all makes this the hardest pill to swallow. My affair was atypical in many ways. Some aspects of the relationship and betrayal were slightly less vile, some were colder and even more evil. The man I had an affair with, whom I will call Paul, was someone I first encountered in group Zoom meetings during the pandemic. I found him brash and smug with no valid reason to act that way. He was the school's lacrosse coach, and I remember being glad that as an English teacher, I would have minimal interaction with him. The first time we met face to face, we shook hands and had some small talk. I felt zero attraction towards him and didn't sense any lustful attention emanating from him towards me during that introduction. I learned he was engaged and told him I was happily married to a man I adored. There was no sexual tension or hint of any possibility of that nature. The school began allowing half the staff and half the students to attend in person for a week while the other half used Zoom, alternating each week. This was meant to help with social distancing and alleviate the students' feelings of isolation. One day, while eating lunch before my next class, I received an email from Paul. He had written some toasts and jokes for his upcoming wedding and wanted me to edit what he'd written. I was accustomed to being asked to edit writing, so it seemed routine. 
It wasn't something I felt was important enough to discuss with William, especially since it pertained to Paul's wedding, and I saw no reason to burden my husband with such a mundane detail. The email included a toast to his parents as well as to the bride's parents. I took what he wrote and added a few phrases to tug at the heartstrings of the attendees, finding the jokes directed at his brother, the best man, absolutely hilarious, but a bit too vulgar for a wedding. I expressed my reservations when I sent back his edited speeches. He laughed and mentioned that he didn't know his family well and that playful teasing was a family tradition. That email exchange marked the beginning of several months of back and forth correspondence. However, as much as it might seem otherwise, nothing became inappropriate until the very end. Not once did anything become flirtatious or sexual. We did discuss sex, but from a purely scientific and psychological standpoint. Our conversations about sex were so dry that they could have made even the most fervent nymphomaniac feel parched. There was nothing emotional or physically stimulating about those discussions. I enjoyed our correspondence because I was certain there was no temptation on either side. We talked about race, politics, religion, science, sports, topics that people often avoid due to differing opinions. Some discussions even became heated. I was reprimanded more than once for my opinions about sex. Yes, I proved him wrong, but I wish he had been right all along. All of this happened during work hours. My husband and I had a landline for emergencies, but as soon as we walked through the door at home, our smartphones were turned off. Paul didn't even have my number to text until I emailed him with a signature at the end. Later that day, he demanded my number to counter what I'd sent. Dozens of other co-workers had my email, and I didn't think much of it. I seriously don't believe Paul had any interest in pursuing me, especially since he was deeply in love with his fiancée. About a month before their wedding day, Paul discovered that his girlfriend had been having an affair with her high school boyfriend for over a year. He was in shock and deeply hurt by the situation. Unwittingly, I became his confidant for venting. I don't know exactly when our conversations crossed a line, but I began to feel genuine sympathy for Paul. I despised his fiancée for what she had done and saw nothing wrong with that. After a particularly rough night for him, he came to school looking frazzled, and I could tell he had been crying. I gave him a hug and spoke with him for a bit. He asked if I could stay after school to talk since I had a couple of hours free after work each day before William returned home. I agreed. In hindsight, I realize now that what drew me into my conversations with Paul was a different perspective. William and I had discussed most topics, but when I engaged in verbal conflicts, it was foolish, pathetic and weak. Yet, that's what led to the affair. Things with William were perfect, we spent every available moment together. I had mentioned a co-worker named Paul in passing to William, but since there was truly nothing going on, I didn't elaborate, and he saw no reason to pry. When Paul started seeing a new woman, I felt no jealousy, only happiness for him. But when William had to go out of town to a construction site in Tulsa for three weeks, we FaceTimed every day, and I missed him morning, noon, and night. With sudden spare time, I found myself also texting with Paul just to pass the time. Instead of an occasional hour or two after school, Paul and I often had time to grab a bite to eat and a drink or two before heading to our separate homes. Oddly enough, the thing that led us to become physical was my clumsiness and the school nurse not being available that week. I sprained my ankle one day while walking up some steps to get lunch. Since the nurse wasn't on site, I went to Paul, assuming he, as a coach, had numbing spray or an ace bandage. He was tending to my ankle when I noticed he had an apparent erection. I was taken aback by his arousal until I realized from his position that he could see slightly up my skirt. For a moment, I found the fact that I was turning him on to be somewhat stimulating. I adjusted myself slightly to see if a better view would make him more aroused, but he called me out on it. I laughed and told him he could work out his frustrations with his new girlfriend. Suddenly, he kissed me, and I pushed him away. He kissed me again, and I resisted. We made out for a few minutes before I realized what was happening. I hurriedly left his classroom and made my way down the halls to my own classroom, sitting in disbelief at what had just occurred. I hadn't planned for it to happen, and I was certain Paul hadn't either. I didn't know whether to call William and tell him about that moment, or wait until he returned home that night. When I spoke to Paul after classes, 
he apologized and urged me not to bring any conflict into my marriage, suggesting we remain just friends. I didn't want to add any stress for William while he was out of town and focused on his job assignment. After talking with William that night about how things were going in Tulsa, I decided to wait and tell him when he got home. However, his company was having some issues with the client and the manpower needed to keep the project running smoothly. There were delays that meant he had to spend two extra weeks in Tulsa. Paul was there for me to discuss what had happened between us. I couldn't tell any of my women friends or rely on any family members because they all rightfully loved William to pieces. I suppose random strangers on a site like this would have been the best option had I known about it, but the person I was venting to was the very last person I should have been discussing it with. One Friday after work, Paul and I went to a new restaurant near the school for dinner. We sat at the bar and had a few drinks, while I explained how unsettled I felt about having to tell my husband what had happened. He asked me how I thought William would react to the news, and I told him that William might want to call in sick the day after I told him, just in case he asked if I seriously thought William would react violently. I assured him that I didn't think so, but I knew it would mean the end of our conversations and messaging, and rightfully so. Paul confessed that he didn't think he would have made it through his breakup if it hadn't been for me. I assured him that I was glad to have been of assistance and didn't regret helping him. When the realization that our friendship would end sank in, I think we were both a little depressed. I drank too much, he drank too much, and I ended up back at Paul's apartment, where things escalated beyond just kissing. As soon as it was over, my conscience kicked in. I should have it kicking in long before, but I knew beyond any doubt that my marriage was over and done with. William and I had always believed that society allows too many second chances for people who didn't deserve them. Yes, humans make mistakes, and while we believed that anyone who cheated deserved a second chance, it could never be with the one they had betrayed. Life might offer the opportunity to love someone else again, but any chances to reconcile with the cheated spouse were totally undeserved and detrimental to both parties. Things became very complicated when William arrived home from Tulsa. I happened to be on my period, so I knew there would be no intimacy between us. Thank goodness, because in no million years would I have subjected my husband to any diseases, regardless of how much I wanted to make love to William one last time. I couldn't allow that to happen. I wrote a long letter to William confessing what I'd done and planned to give it to him after a face-to-face -face confession. To this day, I don't know how William discovered what was going on. For all I know, he had been monitoring my online conversations with Paul from day one. I never got to ask him how he found out about my betrayal and realized what I'd done before I had the chance to tell him, which caused me to fall to my knees and swear I planned to tell him. William didn't believe me, and I wouldn't have believed myself either. He had printed out a stack of texts between Paul and me. Although I didn't deny any of his accusations, that honesty came far too late. He packed a few things into a suitcase and left me on a Monday evening. By Wednesday night, he drove to a shopping center, parked his car, and took his own life. Knowing that I had destroyed our relationship was torturous to my soul in ways I had never known. Knowing that I had even robbed him of a chance to find someone else to be happy with has ruined me. Realizing that I didn't just end my relationship with William, but also every relationship he had or would have had caused more guilt than I could ever express. I could delve into all the things that have happened since William passed away, but much of it would be details that few would truly care about. Suffice it to say, his family hates me, as does my family. My family was disgusted by my actions and continues to be so to this day. Their love for me didn't die, but their disappointment and shame towards me will never end and that's how it should be. The results were not anything I intended, but when choices are made that cause pain and suffering, we are still guilty for causing that grief. I see a therapist twice a week to try and work through things. I was introduced to someone through my therapist, who is genuinely helping me sort through my feelings. Years ago, she intentionally set a small fire to trigger alarms and scare her ex-boyfriend and the girl he had just started seeing. The fire spread quickly, and what was meant to be a joke caused multiple people to lose their lives. She and I have discussed many aspects of her story and mine. Things can never be the way they once were, nor should they be, but if I am to continue living, I need a plan to make what remains of my life as meaningful as possible. So, that is essentially my story. Anyone who wants to post messages of hate, 
and call me a wretched person, go right ahead. I won't be replying, but if it helps you release any rage you have, use me as your verbal punching bag. Those with specific questions, I will answer as best I can, no matter how much some things may hurt to discuss or admit. To those who read this and have been cheated on, many of you may have been intentionally betrayed, but for those who had a significant other, who was just as perplexed by why they cheated as you were, listen to my story. It doesn't excuse anything I did, far from it. But if it helps you understand that you did little to nothing to cause the infidelity, so be it. To those unrepentant cheaters, I hope you do read my cautionary tale and understand that you have the power to destroy not just someone else, but your relationship with many people and a significant part of yourself. I realize I have no right to preach or judge anyone except myself. I just don't want anyone to find their William and lose them. I don't want anyone to sink to the depths I did or cause the pain and sorrow I did. Most of all, I want all the people who have great relationships to cherish them and never take them for granted. As humans, we are not immune to being swayed under the wrong conditions and series of events. When we love someone, we carry part of their soul with us. Just one betrayal makes it impossible for that person to hold that piece of you again. I had my husband's heart in my hands, and I now deserve the fact that I will never again hold his heart, nor will he ever hold mine. This life is far too much pain without harming the very ones we love, and love is far too precious to risk on anything. In summary, I cheated, which led to my husband committing suicide mere days after confronting me. This is intended as a final response update. First, someone shared a link to a post asking if William posted it. William didn't have read it, as far as I know, and considering he's been dead for a year, I doubt it was him. It was a sad story as well, and I truly hope they didn't take his own life. For those trying to psychoanalyze me to make sense of the things I've done, I appreciate the effort, even if it was for your own self-interests. None of the many professionals I have seen so far have a good theory as to why I allowed things to happen. I feel there should be some valid reason why I did what I did too, but I just can't come up with one, and it wouldn't be a valid reason to do what I did if I found one. For those who swear this is fake, I can't fathom a reason anyone would post this for anything other than to warn and perhaps help. It certainly wasn't a karma grab. I've barely responded, so it wasn't for attention, and it certainly wasn't to lift my spirits, because I've rightfully been slammed for my betrayal. Admitting to something horrible is not easy, imagining it never happened doesn't help me, but it does you. I do not keep in contact with Paul and haven't heard from him since before William committed suicide. The only things I know about him are second-hand from people I worked with. I have no interest in being with Paul or having him in my life in any way. So, to those thinking I planned my vile actions to ride off into the sunset with a former lacrosse coach, no, bless you all. I won't be commenting anymore, but I'll leave the post up as a resource in case someone needs it in the future. Bless you all. May you have stellar lives full of happiness, but most of all, peace.